Look, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mike Donoghue and I'm the uh, development manager for AFAN based here in Toowong in, uh, in our offices in Brisbane. I'm joined this morning by Craig Ball, one of the founders, and also Ian McPherson. So let's get, uh, let's get stuck into it. I thought I might just, by way of introduction, just uh, share some statistics and uh, stats out of, uh, out of some of the recent exam results. And as recently, uh, these uh, stats are updated to the 6th of July, just last week, but more than 14,850 advisors have passed uh, the exam, which represents 74% of, uh, of the advisors on the financial advisor register. Conversely, of course, that means that 26% haven't passed the exam. And as recently as yesterday, uh, two advisors have reconfirmed to me that they won't be sitting the exam, notwithstanding the announcement of the government uh, of two weeks ago about extending the time. Uh, and uh, more recently, the exam results for May, very similar to those in March, but 67%, uh, sorry, 69% of those that sat the exam in May passed. But of course, that leaves 31 who, who didn't pass, and we've spoken to a number of them last week, and the March results were 67%. So look, it's a big number that, uh, and we know that uh, advisors, uh, I spoke to four yesterday who are beavering away studying to do the exam on Saturday and, and Tuesday, and uh, we wish them uh, all the best. Um, an interesting uh, a statement by AFA uh, last month, uh, that a number that the number of financial advisors in Australia since the Royal Commission has fallen by 30 percent. Mm. That's three zero, three zero percent uh, since the Royal Commission. So that's a big number, thereby reducing access and affordability to uh, to financial advice to financial advice across the country. Uh, just on the issue of of AFAN, and we are joined by an advisor. Uh, Mark, and we thank you for it, but uh, Mark actually came up with uh, the name, uh, Australian Financial Advisor Network. So we thank you uh, for that, Mark. But the thinking and the concept behind AFAN uh, of a couple of years ago is really the brainchild of Craig, who's sitting in McPherson. Craig himself uh, is a risk specialist and specialising in estate planning and has been an advisor for what, over 35 years now, I think, Craig? Almost. <laughs> Almost. Craig regales that I was one of the first BDMs to ever go and see him out at your office, out at, uh, at Holland Park, I think it was. Um, and Ian, of course, uh, a specialist uh, in, in finance. And we'll talk about some of these issues uh, and what we've brought in under the one roof into, into AFAN a bit later. So we'll touch on a bit of that uh, a bit later about what AFAN's trying to achieve uh, for clients, for their clients and your clients uh, under the one roof, if I can put it that way. So what Craig and, and, and Ian refer to AFAN as a collective or a cooperative of financial services uh, experts and advisors sharing ideas, but also it was around, uh, I think it's fair to say, Craig, um, trying to save advisors, uh, not seeing them go by the by the way. So retaining good advisors in the in the business in the industry, but also retaining some of the good staff of those advisors. And of course, two weeks ago, uh, we had the government uh, come out and extend the time to do the exam. The thirtieth of September next year. Um, now that's subject to certain conditions, of course, that you have uh, at least made two attempts. And if you have failed two attempts by the 1st of January 22, then you can, uh, uh, you've got up to uh, the 30th of September next year to continue. But it should be noted, uh, Craig, that that, and Ian, that's only a bill uh, that has been tabled in Parliament. I haven't got an update in the last couple of weeks, but it's yet to be debated uh, and passed. 
So we, you know, I think it's a case of watch this space a bit. Um, but you'd have to think that uh, the minister, Hume, uh, would be very confident, must be very confident about getting that over the line. Otherwise, she, she would have hardly have gone uh, public on it. So I thought it was worth just uh, re-encapsulating where we've come from and, and the uh, the origins of uh, of um, of AFAN and uh, how it came about and the thinking of Craig and, and Ian. So I think that's probably enough from me, Craig, for by way of introduction. Uh, we've got a, a number of questions uh, from advisors, and I'll address them. Uh, later on in this session, but I'll just hand over to Craig and Ian now, uh, who want, just want to say a few words um, uh, before we uh, get on to uh, any questions. So, Craig. Thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks for attending, everyone. Just a bit of an update of uh, where we're at. Um, Ian and I'll just give you a broad overview of what's happened with AFAN in the last two years. Uh, as Mike mentioned, um, the concept behind it is to try and keep the good people in the industry rather than just seeing all the experience go out the out the back door. And a perfect example, as Mike said, is uh, Nancy, our office manager. Nancy worked for a planner here in Brisbane called Tony Rigby. Um, Tony was your quintessential financial planner. He ticked all the boxes. He had zero complaints in 30 years of practice, but the industry has lost him. Um, I had known, I, I know Tony personally. Um, I had, uh, I knew Nancy. Uh, for a number of years as well. And when I saw that he was leaving and, uh, and she would be out of work, I just thought that, well, this is a, a double hit to the industry and we can't, as an, in, as an industry, afford that. Um, there was nothing we could do about Tony. He'd made up his mind. But I uh, approached Tony and said, AFAN needs a very experienced practice manager. Um, what was Nancy like? And he said, in my 30 years of practice, she's the best I've ever worked with. Um, that was enough for myself and Ian to say, yep, let's make sure we don't lose that experience. And so she came on board um, almost straight away. Um, we have a head of financial planning here in Brisbane, Gordon, who's, uh, who's joined us over the last couple of months. And uh, we also have a financial planner called Liz on the Gold Coast. Um, and we're talking to a third financial planner who will once again be based in Brisbane. Obviously, Craig, Ian, uh, myself, Ian, and uh, Paul Geisel, who is our aged care specialist based here in Brisbane and we all have different areas of specialisation but we're also talking to a second aged care uh, specialist team who work out of northern New South Wales and the Gold Coast and their service offering is really quite unique and it actually goes beyond placing someone into an aged care facility. Um, one, of, one of the partners in that business has actually worked in aged care in administration and nursing uh, most of her working life and once clients have actually been placed into the facility, she goes into that facility three or six months later to ensure that what the facility managers have offered and what they're charging the clients is actually being provided. And if it's not, then she goes into bat for the clients to either renegotiate the terms of the contract or to move them to a new facility, which once again, just takes that level of care and service to another, another uh, level. And, and that's what we want within AFAN is, is a really client focused um, uh, care and service with, with all of our different areas of expertise. Um, we've uh, uh, got David on uh, listening in today, David Bacinelli, who's our first consultant. <coughs> David's been with us um, pretty much from day one as well. And David's been working well with um, myself and, and the other specialists to ensure that his clients understand the full range of services. We have a suite of uh, lawyers around the country that uh, are estate planning specialists. Um, and Ian and I, when we put this business together, there was a lot of things that we didn't know and that we're learning on the run. Um, and I'll get Ian to expand on them a little bit more, but in things like the onboarding process, when someone decides to come on board with us, what's involved? Um, the payment of commissions process, which has been a real bugbear for Ian, uh, but he's pretty much got that worked out now. But once again, it was something that we hadn't done um, personally in our businesses, but we've had to develop those systems. Even the drafting of agreements, you know, we have advisors coming in in different capacities. So we, we need to understand what requirements they have and how that should be drafted into legally binding agreements. Um, at the moment, as I said, we're talking with a number of people and we're talking, looking at adding on additional services such as salary packaging. Um, so 
it's a it's an ever evolve, ever evolving business at this stage and the, and the further down the track we go the more opportunities are presented to us um, I might just get you to expand a little bit further Ian, not only on that but also on what's happening on the technology side with APAN. Sure, thanks for that, Craig. And um, I think it's a really good point that has been brought up by Mark earlier. You know, there's a lot, a lot of, um, you know, onus on the advisor now for education standards, uh, costs for being in the industry, and it's getting harder and harder. And I think one of the things we've learned in the last couple of years about what we're trying to achieve with this business is that, and we did identify this a while ago, you've got to start digitizing your business or you're not going to be able to keep up. You will not be able to keep up with the regulatory controls uh, and you'll find it difficult to maintain simply what you've got. The concept of what we've done is, you know, it goes beyond just picking up um, advisors who want to give up their, their proper authority, but also advisors who want to remain licensed, but want to be more efficient in their business. We're a lot more than just, uh, you know, uh, risk advisors onboarding to AFAN for their clients to help maintain them. We're a, a whole ecosystem now of financial services specialists. And the, the, the ultimate goal for AFAN is to ensure that when we get a client on board, they get an experience where they only have to supply their data to us once. And if they permit it, we can share it among the other services. And this makes us a much more efficient organisation. We'll go into a little bit more detail about that later, I think. Craig, one of the questions was, what, what is the process, uh, the onboarding process? And how long do, does that take? Uh, I think um, the, the mistake that a lot of advisors are making when they're deciding whether they should come on or not is a lot of them are sort of holding out as long as possible um, and like either either until the first of January next year, or with the with the extension till September, thinking that you know that you can you can turn off the tap uh, at one end and then turn it on turn it back on with with AFAN, but it actually takes quite a few months uh, to actually to onboard an advisor. It's not done overnight, and the biggest issue is the compliance issue and making sure that everything is on a database. Um, mm. AFAN is a corporate authorised rep with the Synchron Group and Synchron allows two different types of client management systems. One is XPlan, the other one is Advisor Logic. And what we're finding, particularly with the, the older advisors, is some of them um, don't have their client management system up to date and quite a few don't actually use a client management system. So we, we need... The, of the system up to date um, and and the thing that's taking the most time is is you know scanning documents making sure that the data is correct and then doing the transfer um, and the other problem is that not all systems talk to each other um, but we use advisor logic within AFAN and that doesn't talk to every system so it's not a case of going from ABC or XYZ mm. and coming straight across to advisor logic um, so w one of our internal problems is working out how to transfer the data with the minimal uh, amount of ease. Um, we are going to engage a company on the Sunshine Coast that will assist with that process for those that need it. And, but obviously that comes at a cost. Yep. Um, and the other thing is that if someone is leaving uh, a different licensee, then the licensee itself will have different requirements that the advisor must meet. Once again, normally from a compliance point of view, and uh, part of that is a, is a final audit, um, and that takes time. So if you're considering coming on board with AFAN, um, have a look at your current agreement with your current licensee and get a full understanding of what the requirements are going to be if you exit, and one of them will be a final audit. And then secondly, um, make sure that your client management system is up to date. If you're not using one, then we need to work out how to get it onto something where we can transfer data. And that might be X plan. Um, there'll be a lot of scanning involved. Yeah. Where possible, we'll help. But it, a lot of that responsibility is simply going to go back onto the advisor who's coming on board with, with AFAN. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's a, that's a real issue, Craig. If you get to the end of the year, you're not going to continue um, or whatever the milestone happens to be where you're going to leave the industry and you think, well, I'll just jump over to AFAN. If you haven't got it in order before you do that and the cutoff hits you, whatever period that is, um, your commissions and trails simply go to the platform manager. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And that's a really big issue. And I think a lot of advisors <laughs> don't realise that, Ian, is that, um, you know, if, you're, if you haven't met the education requirements by the due date, on the 1st of January, the licensee can no longer pay you your trailing commission. But they will get paid the trailing commission from the insurer. But then there's the issue of um, who's going to be looking after that, who's going to be servicing the clients. And one of the things that the licensees don't want to see, they don't want to lose that revenue. Mm. So essentially what happens if, if an advisor hasn't been able to sell his or her business and the trailing income stops for that advisor, then um, the, to ensure that the revenue is retained, the licensee is just going to treat those clients as orphan clients and hand them out to authorised reps within their group. Mm. It's a similar oh, really? that. So you've, you've now got you've now got zero income and zero chance of selling the business because you're not authorized. Yeah, and we think it's about a two month process, right? In normal. Yeah, um, two, two to three months. Um, it's, yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah. yeah, we've been surprised uh, with some of the older advisors that you know they're still running on hard copy files and uh, all this all this information needs to be scanned in. It's a it's a big task and it needs to be started sooner than later. One other question uh, for, for, for you, uh, Craig and Ian, is uh, around some of the success stories uh, uh, that um, you know, we've had along the way. So uh, um, there's probably more than I can remember, but uh, I know you've got a couple to share with us. So. Yeah, and I, and I think I, you know, I mentioned our first guest, um, our first um, consultant, David. And one of the, one of the things that you know, is obvious in our industry is that if you're a specialist risk advisor, you've been told, you've been taught to look for opportunities to sell insurance products. Um, you know, some advisors have set up relationships with different specialists or, uh, over a period of time, but essentially, licensees and insurance companies have taught us how to sell insurance products. So when you open a file or when you look at doing a client data form. As a risk advisor, you're looking solely for an opportunity to sell an insurance product. The problem is that if you look at any given uh, client base, at some stages, yes, they will, your client will need insurance advice, but often they'll need advice in other areas. And so what's historically happened is that that client has then been referred on to someone, whether it's for finance or for aged care, or for superannuation, or you know whatever the service has been, it's been referred on to someone, and then um, you know with with the banning of referral fees, another party, a third party, is being rewarded uh, for looking after that client with that particular area of expertise. One of the things that we're very big on here in AFAN is looking for all of the opportunities, and so that's part of the training process with our advisors when they come on board is you know, take the blinkers off. Let's not look at just insurance opportunities. Let's look at all the opportunities. And uh, we've had a number of success stories uh, within the group of clients who have been risk clients who have been able to uh, utilise the other services, whether it's uh, financial planning services, where once again, our planners have been brought in and fees have been paid, whether it's our general insurance advisor, where once again, risk clients have been um, introduced to our general insurance group um, and uh, business has been written and substantial premiums have been paid. And it all comes down to taking the blinkers off and looking for the opportunities for all of the services rather than just an opportunity to sell a life insurance product. Yeah, and it goes a little further than that. It's, it's what the client needs when the client needs it. Um, and being able to address that, they'll get it somewhere else or you'll have to refer it out. Why not keep it all within the one group? 
And, we have and much better, clearer idea of what the client's um, requirements are, and we build upon that as we go. And, and, the, and the real benefit, obviously, is, is for the client because they get that service provided, and it's done um, you know, via a, uh, a, an advisor or, or now a consultant because they've given up their proper authority, but someone that they built a, um, a lot of trust with. But it's a, it's a requirement within the APN group that the consultant actually project manages that process. You know, they're pay, being paid a consultancy fee um, when that service is provided. So if it's an aged care service or a general insurance service or a superannuation or financial planning service, the risk consultant is required to project manage that whole process to ensure that the service is provided in a professional manner. Uh, and they get paid for that. So they're not only getting paid a, you know, a very uh, healthy percentage of their ongoing trialing commission, but they're picking up consulting fees when the client engages uh, in all the other services that are provided. Mm. Uh, good point. You, you've raised a couple of issues there, Craig, training. There's a question around that, and I'll get to that a bit later. But remuneration, uh, and there's been a question on the remuneration model that we originally had in place which was 70-30, um, but that's not set in stone. Uh, you know, and, and all these things are evolving and we're learning as we go along, but there are a number of questions and, and um, a couple of advisors picked up on it on my email that we sent out last, uh, last week, uh, that perhaps the remuneration model has changed. Certainly it has changed for anyone who comes on board uh, to the end of this year. But do you want to talk about the and you just touched on the remuneration and uh, and what is expected of the advisor in terms of project manager relationship, because it's that, that advisor that has the relationship, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, so just on the remuneration, um, we Ian and I both um, agreed that we needed to draw a line in the sand somewhere. We didn't really know how much it was going to cost us to provide the services. So we decided, well, let's go with 70-30, and then we can measure that. Um, what we've found is that 70-30 is a, was a good starting point, but mainly for those advisors where their ongoing trial was up to about $100,000. What we've found is that for every $200,000 of revenue that comes into the APAN group via A or a number of advisors, we need to employ another staff member. Um, so we've got the costs uh, of employing that person perhaps training them up, getting them new equipment, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're about is making sure that any consultants that come on board, they can still earn a healthy living, but Ian and I aren't you know, losing a bucket load of money by doing that. So we've, just, we've got to be able to cover our costs. For those advisors whose trailing commission is higher than $100,000, then we look at, the, look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and, and once again, we've got to make sure that we can cover our costs, but also it's attractive enough for the advisor to say, yeah, I want to join you guys because there's a terrific opportunity uh, for me to continue doing what I'm doing. There's a terrific opportunity for the clients um, to take advantage of the services and uh, you know, to spread the horizon. Just on the, uh, on the project management, um, you know, it, it is a requirement. You know, if we were simply to buy a client base, the, the, the clients don't trust us because they don't know us. You know, they trust you, the advisor, because you've had the relationship with them for 20 or 30 years. Um, buying a book, to me, is, is sort of the last option that we want to consider. Um, if we can keep the trusted advisor within the group, um, it just makes sense because it's going to ensure that there's very, very little drop-off of clients because um, you know the, the clients like you, they 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 un, that they understand the um, um, recommendations you've made uh, over the last number of years. You would have been managing their claims, so you know they're, they're more than clients; they're probably advocates. Um, but more so, when you say you really need to address this issue, whether it's you know getting your will structured correctly or getting your finances check because you're paying too high an interest rate or you know you don't have enough in your superannuation fund or there's an issue with your self-managed super fund if it comes from you the advisor they, they're going to listen if it comes from us the stranger uh, they'll go out and get a second opinion 
Um, so that, that the whole model works best when the consultant stays on board in the group and maintains the relationship. Yeah, agreed. They stay and maintain the relationship, but they also expand upon that relationship by accessing the other services. Mm -hmm. So it enhances the client experience for that advisor. It actually deepens your relationship with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is a consultancy agreement and an advisor comes on board as a consultant, a contracted consultant. There is a consultancy agreement and we encourage all advisors slash consultants to seek their own tax advice and, and legal advice around that. And the contractual period is for five years mm -hmm. and we're paying the 70% and that's how we come up with that 3.5 factor that Ian always talks about, paid out over the five years. But there is a facility also, Craig, to, to pay out uh, early and there's a formula around that. So um, so I think that is, that's addressed the, the remuneration model. Um, the other, you touched on it earlier, Craig, around training. Um, we have run a training session in here for our for, for the advisors. Uh, I'm not sure how many uh, know of Craig's software that he put together a few years ago, the Allocator. It's an absolute ripper, and I wish I'd uh, seen it uh, when I was uh, as an advisor myself. But it's around paying out the death benefit under super and saving a truckload in tax, but paying it out, paying part of that death benefit out of super as a child pension. Now, there's a link to it that I can send advisors. Uh, and there's a demo demo that runs for about three minutes. Uh, and I'd encourage uh, any advisor who wants to have a look at it, just flick me back an email. You've got my contact details from last week and I'll send you that link. But it's around this estate planning issue, Craig, that you specialise in and you've got all these advisors, sorry, lawyers around town and and in other places. And a number of advisors have told me over the last 12 months since I've been on board that, you know, the estate planning is a bit tricky for them. Um, but we do some training around the allocator software and the estate planning, don't we? Well, we have done in the past. We, we've done, we do training on all areas. And just on the um, estate planning, there's a certain way that we do things within AFAN. And it, it's about making sure that, um, you know, when, Clients, they work hard for their assets um, and most of them want to make sure that when they do pass away, that the assets only go to those that they choose. What we don't want to see is a situation where you work hard for your assets, you don't have your estate structured correctly, and then all of a sudden in-laws or even ex-in-laws are able to get access to the assets. So it's about protecting the assets, number one, and number two, minimising tax. And so whether I'm doing a, a session on estate planning or... Ian's doing a session on commercial or personal finance or Paul's doing a session on aged care. It's just what we're doing is we're teaching consultants about the way we do things in APEC. So if you've got clients that you bring into the group where they have minor children or there's minor grandchildren, you just know that every single one of those clients is going to go through our particular estate planning process. They're going to be introduced to it. They may not take it up. Um, there's never any obligation to take up any of our services, but we want them to be able to make informed choices. So what we're doing is showing them the tools that are available uh, within you know, particular areas. And with my area of estate planning, it's how those tools work. What are the benefits to the family? What are the tax benefits? What are the implications if they don't take advantage of those uh, tools and resources? And then they can make an informed choice as to whether they want to use them or not. The reason why we do the trainings session is because once again it's it may be an area that a consultant is not uh, up to speed with but we just want them to have the confidence that when they go into a meeting to discuss this they're going to have a specialist sitting beside them whether it's aged care finance general insurance uh, financial planning estate planning business succession planning when they're in the meeting with their client their role is to um, just maintain the relationship and make the client feel comfortable. But when those difficult technical questions come uh, are presented, then a specialist will be there to uh, give the support during that meeting. And that's essentially why we run the training sessions is to say, this is how it works. You don't need to know the ins and outs of it, but when the question comes up, one of us will be sitting beside you. And uh, when you have a look at the demo, three minute demo, 
you'll be blown away by the tax saving that uh, Craig demonstrates. So uh, if you want to have a look at it, uh, come back to me. Uh, the other question that uh, comes up a bit, Craig and Ian, is what if I've, I've passed the exam, I've done the phase of the exam, or I I'm, I'm hope to pass it, um, is there still an opportunity to, to join an APAN? And, and what are those, those opportunities? Might end up to you, Ian. Yeah, I, look, I, as I said earlier, I think we need both licensed and uh, those who are giving up their, their proper authority to join the group. The whole purpose of setting up the, uh, the ecosystem as we refer to it is that we can simplify through digitization of the client data access to the other services. So if they join us, they're going to be empowered to do other things with their clients in much the same way as, you know, a risk advisor comes in and then has access to succession and estate planning, financial planning, retirement, financing, those sorts of things. If you're an advisor who's licensed in a specific field, and I'll, I'll give you an example, Craig and I have worked together since we've come up with this concept on a number of occasions, um, like a mortgage client of mine, who works in the mining industry suddenly became uh, aware that he could be personally publicly liable for, for things that happen on the mine side, even if he's not there, which created a succession and estate planning um, requirement. So I introduced him to Craig. We've solved that for him. Craig's had clients on the other side that, that he's helped them with their structuring for their, their family assets from an inheritance. And then they want to go and buy other property for, um, you know, uh, office space and that sort of thing. So he introduces them to me. We're, as we said earlier, taking the blinkers off and thinking about what's the client need. So whether you're licensed or not licensed, there's an opportunity to join this platform. The other one uh, that cropped up uh, and I have raised with advisors in recent times, and Ian, I might throw this one to you, around uh, the technology piece and the fact find. Uh, that uh, given your connection with a third party and how that how we, we're going to see that fact line, the digital fact line interact and flush out other needs. Uh, do you want to address that? Uh, sure. So it, parallel to the to setting up the A-Fan platform, we realised pretty early on that in order to make this thing work, we need to partner with um, a, a technological a software company that can help us to do that. We did a round table with succession and estate, financial planning, um, you know, aged care, and my side from the from the mortgages and the and the commercial financing, and went, all right, what do we collect as data, and how do we add to the client data collection form to make sure that we can, at some point, collect everything for the client. So we've created a, a digitised client data form where it doesn't matter what specialist field the client comes in from we can add to and update that data as we go forward. But more importantly, we only collect it once. So if you're a consumer and I am, uh, and you go to do some other thing with your bank or you need to go and do some insurances, every single time you go and do something, you need to provide your personal information, your financial information, et cetera. Where we're um, trying to get ahead of the game is collect this data once and with the client's permission, we can share it among the other specialist services within the group. So when a succession and estate planning uh, opportunity comes up, Craig's already got the client data in a certain format. So he can make some informed uh, discussion and questions around that with the client immediately uh, as soon as he engages with them. Um, that makes it a lot easier for both the advisors and it makes it a hell of a lot easier for the clients as well. It's a great benefit to them. Making the software smart, um, and what I'm talking about there is that if I enter data for a client, I might be looking for specific things, but I may not be aware, aware of issues that um, you know um, could cause some sort of detriment to the client from a finance point of view or, or something else. But simply by entering data, when an issue comes up, it's flagged. And it could be you know, an issue on finance or aged care or, or whatever, but it's flagged. And I then bring it to the attention of the client and ask the client, look, this particular issue has come up. And a, and a perfect example could be, you know, I'm entering data about a client and his or her family. 
and they tell me that their eldest daughter has just turned 18. The flag that comes up in the software says, uh, you need to, we need to organize an enduring power of attorney for your 18 year old because she's now an adult and you as the parents can no longer make a decision on her behalf. So that's flagged. And then the question is, um, would you like us to arrange uh, to have a discussion with the lawyers to, to get an enduring power of attorney uh, drafted for your daughter? Um, so all that stuff is, is part of our smart technology. And see, when the client says, uh, if they, I'd say, no, look, we're already having, having that issue addressed with our lawyers, not a problem, at least we've brought it to their attention. Or yes, that's a great idea, bang. Then we then forward the relevant information to the legal side or the relevant information to the finance side. And so it's not relying on a human eye to pick up any sort of, um, um, you know, any, any sort of traps that clients could fall into. It's, it's very smart technology and it's, it's technology that's advancing uh, and will become smart. And the other thing I like about it is that it's technology that the clients can, can continue to add to. You know, they will have their own portal and a, a client could sit on a train or in a taxi and update information and, uh, and get access to blogs and all sorts of free information from the, the various uh, webinars or from a library of uh, videos. And uh, you know, it could be just one thing that you know, triggers interest. And as soon as they click on it, they go down the rabbit hole and it opens up a whole um, uh, area of services that they could take advantage of. But it also then allows us to market those services to that particular client and their specific services that the client has said, yes, I'm interested in. It's not a shotgun approach. We're not sending aged care information to a 20 year old. It's something that they've clicked on, they said, yes, I'm interested in. And then that gets fed back to our marketing machine to say, let's now provide this person with further information about this thing that they've said that they're interested in. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean, if we use the example of onboarding uh, a risk advisor's clients and say they've got 100, they put them in the system, suddenly they do have access to uh, the other services through that portal. They can add their own data to it. They can explore things. They can explore things like cash flow management. So for the next generation, if they're trying to save for a house, do you wish to provide us with your bank data? So we've got bank scraping technology in there so that they can set up where their expenditure is going, how they can make savings. Can they afford the deposit for their house given the current interest rates? Let me explore that. Um, what can I afford as a house? Those sorts of tools will be available to the clients. They can also invite family members. So you think about the scalability of it is it's not just Mr. and Mrs. Jones that you're talking to and you've always talked to about their life insurance. Suddenly it's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones and all their other requirements from a financial services perspective. And then it might be uh, his brother or their children. So we're building a family tree and we've got um, a family tree tool being uh, integrated within the software as well and you can invite family members to join and then as soon as that person's given us their name email address and telephone number they've got an account and they can start exploring things and if they wish to they can fill out the client data form and we can track that and we can track it back to the advisor that introduced us to the original people who came onto the system and say that's your client in perpetuity um, it's a great way of scaling, not only from the individual advisor perspective, but from our perspective for the business, we need to be able to do that. And it makes it much, much more efficient than simply laboriously sitting down with a piece of paper, taking their details every time we want to do another service to the client. It, it just can't go forward that way any longer. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt, um, Craig and Ian, you, you, you've brought AFAN a long way, haven't you? You know, when you think about uh, what we've just discussed in the last 45 minutes and what you've pulled together from an idea that you had. And I remember you saying to me last year, this whole thing's evolving and we're learning as we, as we go along. But I think for the advisors out, uh, out there in advisor land and other interested parties, uh, I think, um, you know, we've demonstrated that um, uh, it's a serious operation, AFAN. It's, it's come a long way. Uh, there's been a lot of thought put into it. It's still evolving. Uh, we're listening to what advisors are telling us, uh, and we're happy to meet those needs. 
for advisors with uh, bigger businesses, please talk talk to me. I'll tee up a, a meeting with uh, Craig and Ian. Um, but that, that's about all the questions uh, that uh, uh, that have flowed through. They're, they're the main ones, at least. Is there anything you and uh, Craig and Ian you want to close off with uh, uh, before we wrap it up? Look, I just think that, you know, for those of us who have been around for 20 or 30 years or more, you know, we've all been through enormous change. And I know that uh, Luis Capato is online today. Luis has been around for um, a, a lot longer than me. And, and um, I don't think any of us have seen change like we're seeing now. And so the industry in the next five years is going to be completely different. If you look back to when, you know, Louis joined or when I joined and, and, and some of the other senior people that are listening in, we came through a system where training was provided. I came through the AMP system and, and the training was uh, exceptional. Um, others came through big institutions like National Mutual, where once again, training was exceptional. And there were enormous numbers coming into the industry. That's not happening today. The AMP, companies like AMP, National Mutual, Commonwealth Bank, no one's providing those services for the next generation coming through. And, and uh, you know, everyone, any new candidates in the, in, into the industry, they have to have their degree and then they have to do a professional year. Well, who's providing the professional year for them? Um, it's not a sole operator. Um, very few, unless you've got a very, very big book of trailing income and you can afford to do it, the opportunities for younger people coming in, you know, the people who will eventually buy us out, that's not happening. So it's, it's going to be a completely different industry in the next five years. And I honestly think that um, the, the business model moving forward will be similar to what we're creating here at APAN, where we've got experienced people bringing our areas of expertise together, um, sharing that, our knowledge, sharing our resources, sharing the costs, you know, the, compl the compliance costs and the administration costs are just skyrocketing through the roof. Hmm. You know, sharing those costs so that we can continue to focus on doing what we do, what we like doing, rather than focusing on, you know, um, the compliance nightmare that uh, and and the ongoing studies. You know, I'm currently in my fourth subject of the graduate diploma, and I'm still running succession and state planning and running um, uh, eighth band with Ian. So we've been a little bit busy of late, but um, you know, if you, I, I can only do that because I've got a terrific team around me. To do it as a one-man band, as you said, Mike, those days are gone. You can't do it. And um, it's sad for the industry, but every industry goes through change. This is a, this is a pretty big hurdle. Um, but I think in the future, we're not going to see any sole operators unless they're very, very big independent uh, individuals who have you know, grown books of revenue in excess of a million dollars. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Craig. I think that's that's definitely the case. The industry's evolving and it's making it much harder for you to be a sole practitioner. I think um, those that join us will diversify their client base in terms of what they provide to them. They'll end up knowing a lot more about the same client and they'll empower the client to access the advice and the services they need. The more you think about having the, the client being able to update their own data because they want something and not having to chase after them to do it, I think it really enables uh, the advisor to scale their business and to keep up to date. Otherwise, you're just going to get behind. Okay. On that note, I think Craig and Ian, I think that just about wraps it up. Big thank you to all the advisors out there for taking the uh, the time to join us this morning. We have recorded the session. We're, we're going to put it up on the uh, the website, I think, Craig. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, look, by all means, you've got my contact details. I'll be in touch with uh, the attendees uh, as a follow up. But uh, by all means, come back to us if you've got any queries. Appreciate uh, your attendance. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.